Um, so this is me. I usually work in Scala, but sometimes in my free time I work in Kotlin. Um, so in this talk I will talk a little bit about different languages uh, in the Java Virtual Machine. So I have like 11 years of experience with uh, development. I have five years of experience with Scala and three years with Kotlin. Probably was one of the first ones to actually have a repo on GitHub with Kotlin that was not from JetBrains, the company that creates Kotlin. Um, I have a few libraries. I have Functional, that is the, the library that we will use in this talk. I actually have Kotlin Primavera, this spring framework for Kotlin. I don't know it's not that functional, but still. And I start the project Rx Kotlin Reality Extensions for Kotlin. I was the original developer. I am not the developer anymore. Um, someone will take that leadership from me because I don't have time to maintain all those libraries at the same time. And I did not consider myself an expert on functional programming, okay? So what is Kotlin? Kotlin is an static uh, type programming language for Java Virtual Machine, Android, and also compiles in JavaScript. But careful, because they are working on LBM and iOS integration. So at some point in the future, in a few years, you could develop actual iPhone applications with this. Uh, so how it looks? It looks like this. It has actually a lot of fun. Yeah. It's fun. This is main. And do you have, it, it looks kind of like a Scala in the sense that you have this column and types. Uh, that's it. Uh, so what features do Kotlin has? Uh, we'll look at some fast uh, features. It has classes, OK? It has sealed classes, so you could develop ADTs. Uh, so have data classes that are like case classes in, in Scala. Uh, we have interfaces with methods like Java 8, so not fields, so it's not a trait like Scala. Uh, you have objects, including component objects as a Scala, and you have uh, enumerations, generics with covariance, contravariance, all this kind of stuff. Uh, default and named parameters. Uh, control structures if, else, when, when it looks like switch or match, but it's not exactly like that. Uh, do while, those, all those are expressions, so actually you could return from if, uh, or you could return from try uh, as a Scala. Um, you have null safety, we will talk about this later on. You have high order functions, delegates, we will talk about this later. And extension functions. So how it works the null safety on Kotlin? You have this type string, and that's all right. This is your type string, OK? But if you assign a null to this string, it's a compiler error. Why? Because you define a type, you declare this val as a type that doesn't allow null values. So to have null values, you need to explicitly say a string and question mark. That means that in this particular val, it's possible to include null values. OK? So if you don't include this and you try to assign a null value, th that's a compiler error. The compiler will say, uh, 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 OK, you say that it was not null, and you put a null here. Please don't. Don't do that. So in that case, when you have hello, that is nullable, if you try to call any method here, you need to call that method with a question mark to say, I know that this is null. OK? I know. Because the compiler will start complaining. The compiler is quite, I wouldn't say that word. OK. The compiler is strict on the thing that you could do with null values. So you need to say, OK, I know that this is a null. And he will return, the compiler will return, a value that actually could be null. You know, because if you are operating with values, there are null values, and you do this operation, probably you will be a null value. Or you could use the double bank, and the double bank is, I know that this is not null. And the compiler says, OK, but I will draw a null pointer exception in runtime 
if actually that thing was a null. In that case, I could return a thing that is not null in that case. Okay? So question mark to work with nulls and um, double bank to work with null pointer exception and will return non-null values. If my uh, value is non-null, I don't need to use neither question mark nor double bank. So how does it work? So I have uh, my type system works like this. I have any type that is the super type, like in Scala, and I have a string and nothing at the bottom. So uh, nothing extends from everything, and everything extends from any. But I have also the nullable hierarchy, and the nullable hierarchy is everything extends from a nullable any. So any extends from nullable, a string nullable extends from any, and a string non nullable a string extends from a string nullable. So that means if I declare a method that receives nullable strings, I could pass nullable string or non nullable string. You know, because the hierarchy is like that, but not the other way around. So if I declare no nullable, I can pass a nullable because that means that is not the right hierarchy. Okay, everyone with me? Next. Um, and that is null safety. Now, high order functions, it, all the functions are look like this. Oops. All the functions look like this. So I have function one uh, to function 22. Actually, I have also function zero. So I have function one, and I have uh, the invoke operator. So the invoke operator is like to call this without uh, using the function, mm, uh, the function notation. So in this case, I have this big function, yeah, and I have one int, two ints, and a function that is two integers, and I will return another integer. Okay, so I could declare like this. I will use it like this. Do it numbers two, three, and I pass my function. The, look how we call that function internally. So it's just f and parenthesis. When I call f and parenthesis, I am calling the invoke operator. Or if my last parameter is a function, I could pass that parameter outside the parenthesis, like Groovy, or Ruby. Actually, I think that Ruby do, do that too. I am not an expert in Ruby, but it looks like. So that means that actually you could have your own control structures. So anyone knows Ruby? Yeah, Ruby has an onless control structure that actually is like a negative if. So execute this if is false. And you could create an unless with Kotlin if you want. So I have a condition that is a Boolean and I have a body. Yeah, so if this thing is false, I will execute this thing. I will create my own control structure. Easy. Uh, delegates. Are two kinds of delegates are delegates in classes are delegates in properties. Um, so in this case, this is actually co uh, code from my library. I, we will talk about that library later. But this is a partial function, and this partial function actually extends function one. So if I extend function one, I should declare invoke. Do you remember that we have that signature before? I have an invoke parameter, an invoke uh, operator, but because I am delegating my implementation to a value I don't need to declare invoke. Okay? So you have uh, the first value that actually is a function defined at, as a partial function. And the second parameter is the proper function. And I will use that function that is a value. I will use it as my actual implementation with this, um, with this word by. So it's this is my function. I extend 
from function one and my implementation of that particular uh, or that particular method is delegated to that value. So I don't need to declare internally invoke. Uh, it also works similarly to properties. So actually Kotlin doesn't have lazy. What we have is lazy in defined in a library. This lazy is a library, is is a function. But we use by, and with that by it means I will delegate the behavior of this property to this particular class. Lazy will return me an instance of a class that actually had a special signature that we don't have time to review, but you believe me, okay? Use your faith and believe me that actually this is a lazy. But it's not a language uh, feature, it's a library feature. So that means that you could create your own laces if you want. Uh, this is another example with observable. So I have name, a string vi, observable. Actually, it comes from a library. You could create your own, as I told you. And you have three parameters here. Prop, prop is the, like the meta information for that property. My old value and my new value. So when someone tried to uh, overwrite or, uh, or uh, assign values to my property name, uh, then I will print this, this string. But this is not lang language feature. This is a library feature. Okay, and you could create your own if you want. So that's a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of creativity and things that you could do right or wrong if you do it bad. Now, funny thing, extension functions. You could add functions to your existing types. In this case, we are adding the function from Minsk to a string. So a string dot from Minsk, and this is a new function. So I could call hello world dot from Minsk. From Minsk is a method that I add to the string class. Okay, and this is evaluated in compiling time. So when you try to compile this, if this doesn't exist, this will blow up because, the, because it's, it's, this is type safe. This look as Groovy meta classes, like you could do that on Groovy, you could do that on Ruby too. It's, the, the advantage here is that it's, it's compiling, isn't at compiling time, so it's safe to use. Also, you could create like nasty things like this. I will add. I will add an invoke operator to my string. So I could call a string as this. Actually, this is not a function, but it looks like a function because I add that invoke operator to my string class. OK, so you could create DSLs like this. It looks horrible, but it's possible. Uh, and with those extension functions actually are being, used in, in the, are, are being used in the Kotlin library. So all the functional operators that you expect to have in a um, collection library, like map, flat map, filter, all those, all those are implemented using extension functions. Um, so this is the, this is all the features that, not all the features, but the main features that come with the language. So the language will let me to create a lot of crazy stuff. Let's combine all things. Yay. Let's create the, you know, how many programs in Ruby? So you know that there is a one line on less. Okay, so let's create that in, 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 in Kotlin. So I will extend the function type and I will add to the function type add in fix unless with a conditional. So I have this function here, and unless this is false, I will not execute this. That's it. It's super easy to implement. It's compiling. It's in compiling time, so it's not dynamic. It, 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 if I do it wrong, it will fail. If I am working with IntelliJ or with uh, any other uh, ID that has um, support for Kotlin, it will autocomplete. It will say this is this is right or not. Okay. So this is our, this is all the all the introduction to the language. Now we will talk about the library. So I create this library. It's called Functional. 
actually think that word is German, but I don't know how to pronounce it. So I will say functional. Um, and it's just functional constructs for Kotlin. Because Kotlin doesn't have many uh, functional things inside the language, but the language is powerful enough to let me add new features. Um, so for example, we could, uh, we could have function composition. So how I add comp function composition? Easy, I just create uh, function extensions for the function type. And then my function has more features. So an example of this, you know about function composition. I have this in a Spark. Do you know anything about Apache Spark, the things that you expect, that thing for big data? So I have a map here. I have several maps, map, 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 three maps with functions. So that map, 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 if you have, if you have a, a, a big enough file, it will try to distribute these amount nodes. So each map will be really, really expensive to execute if the file is big enough. So I, what I could do is to have just one map with function and then function and then function. So not three maps that will, in theory, will split, will start three different um, node uh, calling with all the issue with the stuff. Just one with three different functions combined in one. This is all we have, and then forward uh, compose and compose like any functional language. Uh, we also have curry. Not that curry. Uh, the curry that is having a function with this signature, with this arity, and return a succession of functions, a chain of functions. Okay? It's the same stuff. I just define function extensions. The problem is that, because it's not, compiled, it's not a compiler, but it's me doing it by hand. So I need to create all the way from function 1 to function 22. And it looks like this. So here we have these two functions. This is a still, a still a Spark. Uh, this is for uh, in artificial intelligence. So I have these two functions that actually look quite similar, but this parameter is different. So I could have just one function, could read that function, and just call the could read version with one, that is this value, and zero, that is this value. So this is curry, okay? Partial applied functions is different to curry, okay? So partial applied functions is calling a function with less parameters, and that will return me a new function with the parameters that I don't set, I don't fix. So I, if I have parameter uh, this function with three parameters, and I call it with just two parameters, that will return me a function with just one parameter. This is partial applied function is different to partial functions. Two different things. How I build this? Okay, all the way, create this. I, I did this with a script. I don't create this by hand. Okay, so no worries. So all the way to function 22. So I call partially one, partially two, partially one, partially two, partially three, all the way to um, function 22. And also I create this overloading invoke. So you could create, you could call it with partially or you could create, or you could call it like naturally, but just with one parameter, and that means that this file is 2,532 lines. It doesn't take a long to compile it. Okay, it's not that bad. So an example, I have this table. So doctors, patients, nurses, and actually this table looks similar. The only thing that changes is actually this prefix. Good enough. So originally, I have this. Uh, template with a query is 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 a SQL, okay? It's not Mongo, it's not anything fancy. It's just SQL, and I have this function to create this user. But actually, this function look a lot. The only thing that it changed is the prefix. So I could create a function that actually receives three parameters, the third parameter being the prefix. And I could call the functions with the overloading invoke or with the method partially three. And that will return me a function with two parameters. Originally it was three, but now it returns a function with two parameters. Okay, this is partial applied functions. 
Now, so we have options. Uh, but why option if the language is actually null safe? Why wouldn't you want options? Well, because option is more than just for null safety. Option uh, do more than that. Okay, so option is uh, the representation of a presence of absence or absence of a value. And you know, we have examples of this in, in, in Java virtual machine languages, like uh, returning minus one or returning null or throwing an exception. Yeah? Um, but we have these kind of, of things in, in Java virtual machines. Because, my lang because Kotlin is null safe, there is safety how I call options. So you have this thing in Scala. I love Scala. Please, the Scala guys, don't try to kill me. So this is Scala 211. And in Scala 211, you could have things like this. You could have an option that actually is null. It's possible. And they compile, as li at least in Java, in, in Scala 211, doesn't say anything, doesn't, say, doesn't, doesn't throw a warning. Okay, nice. but actually you could fancy like this. It's bad, it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. And I do because I program in Scala. Okay, don't don't don't, don't get me wrong. I program in Scala too. But in Kotlin, actually, you could have, you could say, okay, no, this is not possible. The compiler will complain. You can't have this, or you can't have this because actually you say this actually is a, an option of a string, and you try to put a null inside. What are you trying to do, bro? Yeah. But if you want, if you really want, you could have it. Like, OK, I don't know what you're trying to do, but if you want an option of null, OK, you could have it. It's not the thing that you want, but if you want, OK. So if you have things like this, uh, actually, this is an example. I will take this. Uh, this is a function that we call um, division. And division will let me check if two numbers, a and b, are di divisible by a third one, that is c. Okay, so I will do this. I could create this um, this function using new label types. Uh, it looks all right. No, it doesn't. It looks okay. Or I could change this actually to use options. It doesn't look any better, actually. Or you could transform this into flat maps, and actually it looks a lot nicer. Okay, so the option is still usable in a language that is null, null safe. Okay, so option is not just for null safety. Option give me more features than that. Also, I have my either type. Either type is, uh, in this case, is unbiased. Um, so that is the, the one of two values, not both values at the same time, one of two values. Okay, so. I, it works like this. I have an either, and I have this operation that returns or a string representing an error or a user. So left is an error and right is a user. And when I call this either, I could do things like is left. If it's left, then print the, well, what is this left here? When you have either types that are on bias either types, you need to have projections. So you have this kind of left thing with either types, with unbiased either types, or right. Okay, because it's unbiased. It looks kind of ugly. Uh, it's not uh, the best thing. Okay, so you have this kind of thing with either. So this function actually returns an either. Because normally, how you use either is to define errors. Actually, there is a function in the library that is ether try. So ether try is just call anything that you want. And if the thing throws, throws an exception, I will return a left exception, or I will throw your type, the, the type that you want, in, in the right hand. I still had the problem with the projections. So left, right, right. Doesn't look like that nice. Also, I have these junctions. These junctions, these junctions are either but it's biased, it's right biased. So I don't have the problem with projections. I don't have projections when you have uh, biased types. That actually, Scala 2.12 looks like this. The other types look mm, right biased. So I have the same thing, this junction try. Uh, but in this case, I don't have the projections. So I don't need to call left 
or right, because actually it's right. I know that it's right. Unless it's left, so I need to, I need to call swap to switch it. That, that's it. I don't need to call projections. I don't have projections. So this look like Scala 212 or Scala. That is how it's defined in, in those libraries. With these disjunctions, you could have nice things like uh, flat maps and maps that actually look really nice. For example, I have two users, and I could check at the end if I have all my users or I have an exception. Okay, that is an that is an atomic operation, or I get all my users, or if I get an exception. But what happens if I want a list of exceptions? There is a library, th there is a function is called validate, and it could pass a list, a series or a series of um, disjunctions, and it could operate these disjunctions at the end. So it will return or the list of users or a list of exceptions. It's not just one exception. Is a list of exceptions. Probably the exceptions are different in in in, in each case. Uh, future developments in Kotlin, we will have type alias that will be useful for, for actually for me for my library will be really useful, and you will have coroutines that actually is like blowing main stuff. It's, wow, it's amazing. It's so amazing that I don't understand and I can't explain in this talk. But maybe later the next year we will do a talk on this. Okay? And for the next version of functionality, I will clean up a little bit and I will mo modularize this thing because actually I have this problem. Functional is bigger than the actually Kotlin standard library. <laughs> Why? Because I have all this kind of function all this overloading. So it's bigger than the standard library. Okay, and in function in, in functionality one one I will add more monads. So actually I'm working on state monad and I will include more monads. Probably we will have already Kotlin one one, so uh, some of those monads could use coroutines for doing crazy stuff. And that's it. Thank you. Contact me if you want. And if, if you do a really good question, I will give you, not this shirt, one like this. Okay, not this one, this is mine.